This is Jason Hignay with Whorehound, and I'm very proud and very honored to be joined by Jeremy Jim Slater. Slater, yes, from the Fox Network's The Exorcist. Yes, that's right. Coming to TV screens across the nation in just a few days. Yeah. Really now, right? Uh, a little under two weeks right now. Little we under premiere two weeks. Uh, September 23rd on Fox. Uh, we're going to be a Friday night show uh, running uh, 10 episodes. Um, so it's a nice, uh, contained, serialized story. Fantastic. Now, you are the creator yes. uh, and executive producer. You wrote the pilot episode. Right. And episodes 9 and 10. So you're kind of bookending it then. You've the pilot episode and episodes 9 and 10. Exactly. Oh, fantastic. So I have to ask. I mean, The Exorcist, there's no doubt as to why that would be a subject matter that would want to be revisited. It's one of the perfect horror films um, and one of the best ever made. Yeah. Why, why now? What, what, uh, what, what was the impetus to bring that now? Uh, the impetus was that someone was going to do it no matter what because when you have a title like that, someone's going to try to make money off of it. Um, and I wanted to make sure that if anyone screwed it up, it was me. That it was, <laughs> it was, it was a fan, uh, someone who, who grew up with the original and loves the original uh, quite a bit. When, when the rights holders originally were, were shopping around, the, the talk was that we're going to take the original book and we're going to kind of remake the same story. We're going to remake the movie, we're going to tell the same story just in, in a more drawn out uh, process. And, and to me that seemed, uh, it seemed like a mistake because the original is such a perfect film and I felt like you're never going to do it better than they did, you're only going to do it longer. Um, and so I came in and said, look, I don't want to do this, you guys shouldn't do this, uh, but if you're willing to, to go in a different direction, I think, I really think there's something here. I really think you could tell a serialized story um, with a brand new cast of characters, a brand new story. It's, it's a story that takes place in the same universe, in the same world as the original film, so that we're not, we're not writing the events of that film out of existence. We're not rebooting it, we're not remaking it, we're not saying it never happened. Um, but it's just a new story uh, that takes place in the same world 40 years later, and it's, it's, it's kind of asking the question, um, you know, we know what demonic possession looks like in the 1970s. We know what an exorcism looks like. We don't, uh, we don't necessarily know what it looks like in 2016. And so it, it, it's a question of how do, we, how do we make something that's true in spirit and tone to that original movie and respectful to it uh, and, and kind of lives up to its legacy while at the same time not just following in their footsteps, trying to be our own be our own beast and, and, and tell our own story and have our own characters that you care about. Uh, so that was, that was the appeal is of, of taking a project like this because they're giant shoes to fill. Uh, and and it's, it's frankly terrifying because we feel that pressure on our shoulders every single day. Uh, we're all giant fans of the original movie. We're all giant fans of the book. Um, you mentioned the, the, this weight, this responsibility, and, yes. and I, I can understand that, particularly in, a, in, a, in an environment right now where remakes and reimaginings of classics yes. seem so prevalent. And let's be honest, some of those remakes and reimaginings met with a very tepid response yes. from, <laughs> from true fans. And with Exorcist fans, oh, these people are going to be, you're, you're messing with something here that's precious to me, you know? Yeah. So that weight, I can understand that weight. Now, uh, casting. Uh, yes. The Exorcist. I mean, you're, you're kind of you're Gina Davis. Well done with that one. She's amazing. Absolutely. So how, 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 did, how did she come about being part of it and, and the rest of your cast? Kind of how did that happen? Um, this is my first experience in, in writing anything for television. I come from the feature side of things. So I, I walked into the entire casting process uh, kind of a giant newbie, uh, not really knowing what was going on at all. and. And the network casting process is insane because every network is simultaneously casting um, all of their pilots at the exact same time. So all of the actors are getting thousands of, of scripts thrown at them. Um, and, and we really, really lucked out because we had a really smart, really passionate showrunner in Rollin Jones. And, and he really, he, he refused to settle for less. And so when people were saying, you know, 
cast a show like this with familiar faces, get guys who have done a bunch of genre stuff, get guys who are very familiar to the audience, populate it with TV stars. He was the one really saying, like, let's, let's make some discoveries. Let's find the next great thing. Let's go find some of the best actors in the world. Um, and, and so we really opened up our casting process, especially for our two main priests, Father Tomas and Father Marcus, where we were looking for discoveries. We were looking for great untapped talents. And, and we really found that in Alfonso Herrera and Ben Daniels. And, and, and so the flip side of that coin is when you're bringing in these, these people who, you know, they're not necessarily discoveries to the entire world because Ben Daniels is, is probably the most respected stage actor in England. He's, he's a giant star over here, over there. But over here, he's, he's only been in a couple episodes of House of Cards. He's not nearly as well known. Uh, Alfonso Herrera is, is, is the Justin Timberlake of, of Mexico. He's, he's a massive star down here. Um, but up here, he's only had a very small part in Sense8. So, so they were definitely, um, d they're going to be discoveries to American audiences. And so we knew we needed we need a, a star role in there to kind of counterbalance that and, and, and make Fox feel okay about, yes, this is a show that we know how to market and we know how to get people to watch. So, so they gave us a, a massive list of all the, all the potential names for, for the character of Angela Rance and uh, basically every actor's in town. And, and we went through the list and the second we saw Gina Davis's name on there, it's like, done, perfect. Uh, it's Gina Davis, it's The Fly, it's Beetlejuice, it's, it's uh, League of Their Own, uh, Thelma and Louise. Like, she's, she's a legend for a very good reason. Um, and, and we called her and we begged her and she said yes. Uh, and, and she's doing some of the best work of her career. Mm. Fantastic. So what, um, I, you know, at, at first thought, the, the idea of bringing The Exorcist to a television audience um, for those of us who are true fans of The Exorcist, your first thought is, you can't put that on TV. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, what were some of the challenges of maintaining that intense, visceral, yeah. disturbing, both visually and conceptually, um, kind of arc of The Exorcist, but having to do that within, of course, the constraints of television today aren't what they were in the 70s. Right. But still there are things from that original film you can't do on TV. Absolutely. So what were some of the challenges that you found of, you know, we, we, we definitely need to ramp this up and push it a little further, but still stay within our rules? Yeah. It's weird. Doing a network show, there, there's definitely things that are just off limits and they're always going to be. Um, um, you can't have nudity on a Fox show. It's, Absolutely. You know, I don't think people come to The Exorcist looking looking for for sex um, so that's not as big of a problem but language is is something where you know uh, you can't you can't have someone saying your mother sucks cocks in hell on uh, on the Fox network you just can't do it you can thankfully do we can say it here at Horror Hound thank you very good <laughs> I, I should have double checked um, you can you can always do the TV edit where uh, where whenever they show the exorcist on TV they say your mother darns socks in hell there you go um, <laughs> Yeah, you, you can say that on so Fox. Frightening. Um, so frightening. So frightening. So disturbing. <laughs> um, it is a bit of a challenge, but it, it forces you to be more creative as a writer, and it forces you to come up with new ways to scare people and unsettle people. Um, so we knew going in that our demon, uh, the demons in the show, had to operate a little bit differently than uh, Pazuzu or Captain Howdy in the original, um, because because Pazuzu was very much about filth and shocking and 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 he is going to attack your faith by taking something innocent and kind of profane it and turn it into this sacrilegious, profane creature. Um, we, we don't have the option of doing that, so we have to find new ways to scare you. We have to find new ways to take this a sweet and innocent American teenager and, and slowly kind of destroy her and turn her into something else. So, so there's limitations in, in terms of, you know, there's four or five words that we just can't say. Mm -hmm. We have to find other words. But in terms of scares, in terms of violence and bloodshed and, and pea soup vomiting across the room, um, Fox is, is really committed to pushing the envelope. They really want a, sh a water cooler show that people are talking about. Mm -hmm. And, and we, have got, we have gotten away with some amazingly uh, graphic and disturbing stuff in these first five episodes already. Awesome. Um, so I, I think if you're a, a fan of gore, if you're a fan of, of practical makeup effects, 
um, and uh, you're going to find a lot to like here. Fantastic. Now, I want to think, uh, and, and uh, I'm glad you said that in the first five episodes, we're, we're already ramping it up. You know, The Exorcist, the film, a lot of people kind of forget that, you know, it, for the first part of the film, it's kind of a slow burn. You know, they're, they're really kind of leading you up to the, the final act that's just off the hook. So, um, are, are people going to need to understand that, you know, maybe the, in this pilot episode that we're getting ready to see, um, I actually, I've held off watching it myself. Um, I, uh, I, I, I I've had a few days that I could have watched it, but I'm waiting. Um, kind of like the kid with his Christmas <laughs> present. Um, uh, are, is the pilot about just kind of establishing this universe? Do we start to get a taste of something in the pilot? Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah? Yeah. Fantastic. Um, it's, it's, it's definitely, if, if we were doing a cable show on HBO and we had a guaranteed 10 order, you might see more of a slow burn, but, but the reality of when you're doing a pilot is, is uh, the network is going to give you a set amount of money and you go off and make the pilot and if it's good enough and if audiences respond to it enough um, they give you the money to go and make the next nine right. in a row and so we really knew that we needed our pilot uh, to have big shocking moments we knew it needed to scare the hell out of people um, and it, it, it is a problem when you look at, at something like the original Exorcist film where the first hour and 15 minutes of that nothing scary happens it's, it's, it's a great uh, it's a great drama about spirituality and faith and, and the nature of good and evil, but the shit really doesn't start to hit the fan until almost 90 minutes in, right. um, the point where most exorcism movies are already over these mm -hmm. days. So we really can't duplicate that, especially because that's what the audience is coming to see. And if, and if you show up for a show called The Exorcist and it's like, well, don't worry, guys, if you stick with us for six weeks, then you're going to start seeing some scary stuff. Uh, everyone would say, no thanks, I'll catch it on Netflix someday. Um, we want this to be a show that every single week when you tune in, um, there's going to be things that scare you, there's going to be things that unsettle you. We, we are trying to push the limits of, of what you have seen on a horror show mm -hmm. on TV. Uh, and that means being aggressive in your storytelling. That means if the audience is expecting eight episodes of filler, and then at the very end the, the priests walk into the room and start splashing the holy water, um, it means we're gonna zig when they're expecting us to zag, and we're, if, if, if they're expecting us to hold off on things, we're gonna do them much earlier than you may be thinking, because um, we actually have a lot of story, we actually have more story than we know what to do with this season, because we have such a talented writer's room. Um, so, so the goal is to hit the ground running. I mean, all of, all of my favorite TV shows, Lost and Battlestar Galactica and Buffy the Vampire Slayer, um, they are, they're all propulsive shows that don't really make you wait around for the good stuff. Uh, it, it, it's all about how do you hook the audience every single mm. week and give them something new and give them something fun. Um, and that's kind of what we're trying to emulate here. Fantastic. So I have to ask, there are all these uh, urban legends about the bizarre things that happened on set during the, yes. the, the making of the, the original The Exorcist. Any crazy stories on set? Unfortunately, no. We had a super, super safe, normal, routine shoot. Uh, we went down to Mexico City and we, we spent several days shooting in the favelas of Mexico City, um, one of the most impoverished, uh, dangerous areas in, in the country. Um, but we were accompanied by security guards with giant machine guns at all times and, and we were very safe and not a single bad thing happened to anyone. So, uh, so yeah, unfortunately, um, the, the only exorcist curse right now is that sometimes the batteries on the cameras seem to, to die a little bit early, <laughs> um, or, or, or sometimes we forget, uh, we, we lose the contact lenses. So we, we haven't had any great haunted soundstage uh, stories yet, but the season's not over. It's, not, it's coming. It's not too late to get a ghost in there. Right. <laughs> so uh, talk about the writing team. How, how do you guys go about it? I mean, obviously you developed the pilot yourself. Um, how did you put together the writing team? And you guys have you guys been doing this enough that you kind of have found you, your process on, on how you develop your, your next? Yeah, definitely. Um, uh, the showrunner, Rollin Jones, and I basically sat down together and, and assembled the writing staff. And, and each of us probably read probably 250 sample scripts from, from the different available writers out there. Um, because we were being very demanding and very picky. And, and, and we read lots of scripts that were perfectly acceptable and well-written, um, but we were looking for those amazing writers. I mean, my goal was, let's get a room where I, where I am the least talented writer on the staff. Let's surround us by the best people we can get. And, and we wound up, um, it took a long time, uh, and, and it took some fighting, um, but we wound up with a really unconventional writing staff where we have a lot of 
We have a lot of playwrights. We have a lot of actors. Um, we have a lot of people with really unconventional life stories, uh, people who are new to television but have, have uh, bring a wealth of kind of experience to the table. So it was a really smart, really quirky writer's room. Um, and then we just hit the ground running because we, we had basically maybe five weeks to plot out the entire season and, 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 and get a couple scripts ready for the camera. So we really had to be aggressive in terms of, in, in terms of telling story and, 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 and finding a, a way to stretch an idea like The Exorcist out over 10 hours. Um, and, and the way we wound up doing that is by leaning into the characters because at, at the end of the day, the characters are always the reason that you come back to a TV show. Mm -hmm. um, you know, The Walking Dead has amazing gore gags, but, but the thing that everyone talks about is, oh my God, they killed my favorite character last night, or oh, did you see Daryl just escape from this, or is Glenn really dead? Um, it's, it's, it's an investment, it's a soap opera, and, and, and you have to fall in love with those characters, and you have to, you have to want to see our possessed girl. Um, you, she needs to be saved. The priests need to come together and they need, need to help her. And if you're not invested in that story, it doesn't matter how great our practical effects are. It doesn't matter how spooky some of these set pieces are. Um, you have to give a shit. Um, and, and, and so that's always been our focus from day one, is, is, is telling the best story possible and then finding ways to make that best story uh, scary as hell. Mm -hmm. You mentioned The Walking Dead. That, that, that particular show has done an amazing job of kind of harvesting new horror fans. Yes. The, the Walking Dead was made for a very general audience, and as it's walked down its journey, it's, it's amplified the, the horror as you went kind of slowly turning up the heat on the water to, you know, so that you, uh, you, you kind of uh, assimilate yourself into this as you grow through it. The Exorcist, is this... Is this made for horror fans, or is this kind of made for a general audience to welcome them into this bizarre world? I think it's made for both. Um, we, you know, we, it's, the, the show is very much a psychological thriller at its heart. It's, um, and, and, but that thriller is kind of punctuated by big moments of horror. Um, kind of in the same way that Walking Dead is, it's not a zombie story so much as a survival story. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's a story of this, these survivors kind of banding together and they're fighting the elements and they're fighting other survivors and they also happen to be fighting zombies. Um, but I think if every episode of The Walking Dead was just Rick stabbing zombies in the head for 40 minutes, uh, I think audiences would lose interest. I don't yeah. think they would care. Um, it becomes a story of this surrogate family being brought together and, and wanting to know who will live and die and who will be redeemed and who will find happiness. Those are kind of the questions that make it a TV show worth watching. And so we're definitely taking a, a, a similar approach. And, and honestly, we couldn't have done a show like The Exorcist three years ago without, without the success of The Walking Dead, without it doing, opening the doors that it has opened for television horror. Uh, I don't think anyone would ever take a chance on making something as ambitious and, and, and dark and, and frightening as The Exorcist. Mm -hmm. uh, but, now, but now people know there's an audience out there. There's an audience um, of horror fans who, you know, in the past we had to go to the movies to, to kind of get our fix. Uh, and we had to trade bootleg VHS tapes and, and, and hunt for obs obscure things at conventions. Um, and now you can, you can turn on your TV and get amazing horror delivered. Um, practically every night of the week. So uh, it's, it's never been a better time to be uh, a, a horror fan on TV, and, and we owe a lot of that to The Walking Dead. You guys have definitely, uh, you're going for the Mount Everest of horror movies. You, because uh, I'm trying to think, wow, after somebody um, serializes uh, the, 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 the Exorcist, spreads it out over a process on, on television, where do we go from there? I'm not really sure, but you guys have, you guys have uh, put your flag on the top of the mountain, and uh, we're looking very forward to it. Any last things you want to say to to our, our? And I will say, our horror, our fans are are ardent Exorcist fans. They yes. they are looking very forward to this. They are all behind it. I promise you that. Uh, so That's you've awesome. got a large group of cheerleaders, and we love you guys for that. Anything you want to say directly to them about uh, what you guys got going on? I mean, look, uh, I, I am a lifelong horror fan. I saw The Exorcist for the first time when I was 12 years old, and it traumatized me for weeks afterwards. Um, I'm, I'm obsessed with that movie. I'm obsessed with horror. I've got Jaws tattooed on my arm, and I've got uh, Jaws on my, 
my feet and I've got a Haosu shirt sitting over there, um, no one would be more disappointed than I would be if uh, they made a TV show out of The Exorcist and it sucked. Um, there have been too many bad horror remakes. There have been too many bad horror sequels. Um, so I'm approaching this every single day and I, I've been working pretty much around the clock since last December uh, to really deliver something that's gonna be special for the horror community and, and really make a show uh, that you guys will hopefully embrace and love and be proud of um, because it's being made for horror fans by horror fans uh, and I hope you check it out. Fantastic. Jason Hignite, Jeremy Slater. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you. And check it out on Fox Friday nights coming this fall. September 23rd. Thank you. Thank you. That's a wrap.